Here's a guy who thinks that numbers are spooky, woo-woo, non-physical entities that point to God. This other mathematician, whose name I'm not going to reveal yet, but can in a year or so when he comes out with a book that we're going to be publishing, um, he, he, he took me aside and said, you know, I, I, I love your new book, Return of the God Hypothesis. Um, he said, my wife's an agnostic, but after reading it, she's going wobbly, he said. Wow! But he said, I have a, I have a beef cool with that? you. He said, you got, you got three way, you know, th the three discoveries that reveal the mind behind the, the universe. He says, there's one more. It's math. And I had just read in a long essay that he had, he had written. You can tell the caliber of the discussion by the fact that they're being interviewed by Pool Boy. And I kind of knew where he was going with this, but he, so, but he starts to explain. He says, all mathematicians uh, regard, um, are, are basically mathematical Platonists. They believe mathematical uh, structures, equations, mathematical objects, as the mathematicians call them, circles, geometric forms, um, have an objective reality. No, not all mathematicians believe this. Henri Poincaré, famous for the Poincaré conjecture, was an anti-Platonist. A circle has all the same properties to every uh, geometer, irrespective of their preference. There's, right. We're not we're their not language, relativists. Their, their location um, the, on the, the earth. The, the, yeah. uh, the, the quadratic equation or differential equations, they have certain properties and they are stable and they are mind independent. Universality is a feature of lots of contrived concepts. Bachelors are unmarried from the perspective of everyone who has the same understanding of the meaning of the word bachelor. This is the case despite the fact that bachelorhood and marriage are cultural contrivances. And yet they are independent of our perceptions, but they are conceptual. They are not physical, they are not material. If they're not physical or material, then they are not conceptual because concepts are models created by a brain and are thus physical phenomena. So they're objective, they're conceptual, but they do not, but mathematicians believe they are discovered, not invented. They're discovered, Because they have a reality exactly. independent of ours. This is a common misconception that I think arises from the fact that discoveries are made about invented mathematical concepts. The most basic mathematical concepts are invented, like numbers and geometric shapes. However, once we invent something, we can make discoveries about those inventions. For example, right angle triangles were invented, but Pythagorean theorem was discovered. Well, if they're that, that, that's one of the great ideas of philosophy, right. Pythagorean, Pythagorean exactly. theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That reality exists, whether you're here or not, yeah, whether, the, exactly, whether exactly. the firmament is here, it doesn't matter, that's, that's a reality. Not true, Pythagorean theorem was meaningless before triangles were invented. I think the reason people get confused about this is because when you try to imagine a scenario without humans, you could still imagine the Pythagorean theorem being true. This, however, is projection. In such a hypothetical scenario, Pythagorean theorem is true in the same same sense that it's true that the summer solstice of the year 1 million BCE occurred in June, despite the fact that the month of June is a cultural contrivance that hadn't been invented yet. So, so if they're conceptual, meaning mental. Which means physical, because the mind is a physical phenomenon. And they're not, and they're independent of our perceptions. In whose mind do they exist? They're not independent of our perceptions. You just think that because if you imagine a scenario in which there are no human minds, you're still imposing the ideas in your own mind on that hypothetical scenario. And this mathematician, yeah. uh, now wow. writing a book on this wow. with our colleague David Berlinski, says this seems to point this is deep shit. towards an immaterial mind, towards theism. No, it doesn't. And so Michael? you missed well, you that's missed a, that's some, a number three mathematician you, you, in the you world. Missed something, <laughs> Meyer, he said there was you, it should be that's, four that's four, so four cool. things that reveal that's the mind so mind cool though what, 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 what an uh, endorsement let's see what numbers one and two think of that <laughs> son of a bitch <laughs> son of a bitch he had to get the number one and number two well because it, it, but but again how does science work it's very much a collective social enterprise of trying to convince your colleagues that you've got something worth listening to and that you have evidence for it. Sure. And if you don't, well, that's just the way it goes. I mean, I get letters all the time from people that, you know, that they have an alternative theory of physics too. There's hundreds of them. Uh, but most of them... This isn't an uh, alternative theory of math. This is, this is a... Question. Oh, I understand. This no, is no, a question no, of philosophy point, yes, of course, mathematics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it happens that most mathematicians are mathematical Platonists. They recognize this objectivity and immateriality of mathematical objects. If that's true, most mathematicians should study some philosophy. And that raises a question. If something's conceptual, in which mind does it reside if it doesn't reside in ours? It does reside in ours. It only resides in ours. In the template in the sky. Yeah. And that would be God. Well, okay, so... That would be Yahweh. I mean, so, so, take some basic laws of nature, like, you know, the, it, when, when a star gets to a certain uh, temperature, it, it fuses hydrogen into helium, and you can describe this with math. All right, but 
where is that description? I mean, the, where's the math existing? I mean, it's not in the star. It's where? I mean, it's in somebody's mind describe it, but it's at, the process is actually happening. It's out there. The processes it's used to describe are separate from us, but the math itself is not. It's no more separate from us than language is. It's you know, separate so from us, isn't this it? Is, but, but, we, but we use words to describe it, or we have equations to describe it. You know, where are those? You know, this is a hard problem. No, it isn't. They're in our brains. It's a great yeah. question, and it's one of the reasons that I think quantum cosmology, the alternative to a straight-up Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God, uh, has its own theistic implications. Quantum cosmology does, because the, the explanations, the thing doing the explaining in quantum cosmology is a mathematical function called a universal wave function and an apparatus that stands behind that called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation and superspace. There's a whole mathematical apparatus that pre-exists the universe. That's a contradiction. The universe, or the multiverse if there is one, is all of space and time. Nothing can pre-exist time. It's the physical universe, and the physical universe is explained as a consequence of the mathematics that pre-exists the universe. Now, Nonsense. That's like saying that a thing is a consequence of its description. The that. people, the, the, the guys at the forefront of this, not the popularizers, but people like Valenkin, have said, wait a minute, doesn't that imply then, aren't we then saying, maybe we don't want to be saying this, maybe inadvertently we're saying this, but doesn't that imply that there's a mind behind the universe? Since the universe, or multiverse, is all of existence, it is a contradiction to say that anything exists behind it. And Hawking himself tumbled to the... The, this uncomfortable realization. He said, what is it that puts fire in the equations that gives them a universe to describe? And what he's saying, he's building off of what Mike, Michael just said, is that math by itself has no, it, it's causally inert. If that's true, then the universe can't be a consequence of it. It doesn't, it, it's, 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 it's just there. conceptual. It's, it's not a physical thing that causes other physical things to happen. Yes, it is. So, well, well, but it, I mean, you, there are, there are theoretical theorems that later on, so so somebody writes a theorem, uh, somebody dedicates his life to a theorem, they die at 85, a uh, 100 years later, somebody pulls that off the shelf well, that to is, use to measure that is X, a Y, crazy. and Z. Pool Boy makes a good point. If math were a non-physical, causally inert thing, how could it have any consequences for our thoughts and actions? This mathematician that I was talking about, um, I mean, that's incredible. Th this me. is what his essay was about, is this, uh, this unreal, the, the unreasonable applicability of mathematics to the physical world. He means Wigner's The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. In that essay, Wigner argues that, whereas it is unquestionably true that the concepts of elementary mathematics, and particularly elementary geometry, were formulated to describe entities which are directly suggested by the actual world, the same does not seem to be true of the more advanced concepts, in particular the concepts which play such an important role in physics. He argues that it is therefore unreasonable that equations that involve such concepts should be so useful when describing physical phenomena. They play an unreasonably important role in physics. I don't agree, because while those concepts may not be directly suggested by things we empirically observe, they are conceptually inherent to the concepts of elementary mathematics from which they are derived. An example Wigner uses is complex numbers. These are numbers that are the square roots of negative numbers. Since when you multiply a positive number by a positive number, you get a positive number, and when you multiply a negative number by a negative number, you also get a positive number, that denotes the idea of a special kind of number that has this function of producing a negative product. It's represented by the letter i. The square root of negative 1 equals i. The reason some people think this is some kind of spooky, woo-woo, non-physical entity is because you'll never see a recipe calling for i teaspoons of salt. Nor will you ever see a thermometer that tells you it's i degrees outside. You can't use it to describe empirical observations in quite the same way as you can with regular numbers, but it is nonetheless very useful in physics equations. I don't see this as unreasonable, given that while complex numbers can't be used like the other concepts of elementary mathematics that are directly suggested by the actual world, it is nonetheless conceptually inherent to these elementary concepts. Wigner says, certainly nothing in our experience suggests the introduction of these quantities, but while they aren't directly suggested, they are indirectly suggested. So I don't understand what the history is. They are denoted by the combination of elementary concepts like negative numbers and square roots, so why is it so unreasonable that they be just as effective at describing reality? Quantum mechanics was developed, uh, sorry, the, um, the mathematics of, of uh, complex variables 
um, was developed long before it had any application on the basis of pure deductions, mathematical deductions from first principles. Right, they are inherent to concepts invented to describe empirical observations. There's nothing non-physical about that. Deductions from first principles simply unpack the fuller meaning of those first principles. Numbers and elementary mathematical concepts were invented to describe experience, and complex numbers were discovered to be denoted by those descriptions. And then, 100 years later or so, it turns out to be absolutely critical to doing quantum mechanics. There are many, many examples of this in the history of physics. What is it that provides, why does the, John Polkinghorn, the great Cambridge physicist, used to say, why does the reason within, the mathematics that we develop on the basis of our deductive reasoning, match and describe precisely the reason that is built into the universe, the design of the universe? And he says the best explanation for that is, again, theism. No, it isn't. I gave a better explanation in a previous video. To give another example, let's say you're building a truss for a roof. You know you want to make half the tie beam to be 4 meters, and you want the king post to be 3 meters, so you need to know how long to cut the rafters to get them to fit. Well, you can use Pythagorean theorem to calculate that the rafter length is 5 meters. So you cut some wood to 5 meters, you stick it into the truss, and voila, it fits. Wow! The universe must obey the rules of math, and God must have made it that way, right? No! When you describe this section of the truss as being a right angle triangle, and you describe half the tie beam as being 4 meters and the king post as being 3 meters, you are not then predicting that the rafter will be 5 meters. The idea that the rafter is 5 meters is conceptually inherent to the description that you've already given. By saying that half the truss is a right angle triangle, half the tie beam is 4 meters, and the king post is 3 meters, you are effectively already saying that the rafter is 5 meters. It's not a coincidence that the measurements of the truss happen to be logically consistent with the measurements you've already made. It certainly isn't something that needs to be explained by a supernatural designer. The reason why complex numbers are effective for describing quantum phenomena is because they are already a part of the descriptions of simpler phenomena that use the more elementary concepts that implicitly contain them. There, it provides a principle of correspondence that the same God who made the design, the rationality, the orderly patterns we see in nature, made our minds in such a way to discern the mathematical structure that is inherent in those in those systems, and that's why we can do science. Meyer makes the assumption, which is very common among religious apologists, that the default state of reality is chaos and order must exist because it is deliberately imposed by a conscious mind. There is no valid reason to infer this to be the case. I think people infer it from the fact that minds can put things in order, therefore they reckon wherever there is order, there must be a mind that imposed that order. This is affirming the consequent. And actually that principle of correspondence was one of the key things that inspired the scientific revolution it was called the principle of intelligibility. And all the great theists who were the early founders of modern science, Boyle, Kepler, Newton, believed that nature was intelligible and could be understood by the human mind because the design in nature issued from the same intelligence, namely God, who made our minds in his, likeness, in, in his, his likeness, likeness, so that we could understand nature. If he made our minds in such a way that we could understand nature, why did he make us so fallible? You can't say that it's because of the fall, because the fall wouldn't have happened if we were infallible from the outset. Also, we don't even know for sure that the universe is entirely intelligible. There may be aspects of it that we will never be able to understand. And science does not require that everything be intelligible. You don't need to assume that any particular phenomenon is intelligible to use science to investigate whether it is intelligible. It's a hell of an argument. I mean, although you know, I should point out that some, since I, I can mentioned, feel Michael's skepticism. We, well, you mentioned uh, Max Tegmark before. Uh, you know, he deals with the same problems and does not come to the theistic conclusion at all. Even if it were the case that math were some woo-woo, spooky, non-physical entity, it would not necessarily follow that they come from some ultimate mind. everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.